Hello and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Sama Morningstar and I have Marion here with me. I'm so excited to talk with you, Marion. We were just talking about womb listening. Uh, Marion and I were introduced recently by a mutual friend who thought we would hit it off, and that friend was absolutely correct. We've <laughs> had several uh, very inspiring conversations about womb-centered healing and what that means in our lives, and um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself more and share about this womb-listening practice that that you have been introduced to since meeting me and checking out what I'm doing. I'd love to for you to share your experience a little bit more about that and what that means for you. Yes. Um, so my name is Marion Henson. Um, by trade, I'm a digital marketing specialist, but um, more recently I've been focusing on my writing and finding your voice. And it led me to kind of this womb listening in you, um, in a sense, because I feel like the more that I listen to my voice and find that voice and I'm guided back, it goes right back to my womb and trusting my intuition and my gut and that feeling and being able to listen and to follow directions and be able to kind of, you know, now rebuild or um, set my life up in the way that I guess my ancestors and God intended, mm. right? Sometimes when we're moving um, and we're not listening to our womb and we're not trusting our intuition, we are getting things that we think are pretty and, and nice, but they're not really feeding our souls. So I'm on this journey now to not only find my voice, but to reconnect to reconnect to myself, reconnect to my ancestors, reconnect to who I am in my identity as a woman, as a black woman, as a Jamaican woman, as a person who comes from a mixed ancestry and culture. So this is the opportunity um, given in the current climate that we're in to really just go back and basics go back to basics to learn to trust ourselves again mm -hmm. yeah well we were talking about that before we hit the record button <laughs> which <laughs> often happens on these podcasts we get started with the conversation before i have to go back and and talking about how basic uh it is for individuals to have a connection with our own self and our own center of guidance, ground of being, and how our society has disconnected many of us from that by uh, and stolen that from us, really. Uh, and I would even uh, venture to say uh, that that was an intentional something that was intentionally stolen from the common people in, to, to be replaced by these external authorities uh, for those who stood to profit by that or gain power and control by that to, to gain just that power and control mm -hmm. over others. Mm -hmm. And so all the things that connect us with our inner guidance and with um, the wisdom of life, namely the womb as the main connection to that has been um, thwarted and suppressed and yeah. violently, um, violently uh, persecuted yeah. and, and, you know, for, for many, many uh, generations and as the systems that are based on that disconnection and that exploitation of the many for the luxurious benefit of the few, um, as those systems are showing their unsustainability right. and their vulnerability, uh, we are being invited by the way that things are yep. <laughs> Namely, here we are in global pandemic to yep. come, come back home to ourselves, to ourselves yeah and yeah, and ourselves <laughs> right and this has been a, co a, a conversation that you know many of the podcast episodes i've had quite a few since the the global um stay at home 
impulse and it's everybody's sort of in the same boat and there many of us have been who are who have been involved in holistic healing particularly mm -hmm. womb centered healing for some time this the need for this is not new no. and we've been over here you know i've been over here at home with myself wishing <laughs> the rest of the world would just stay at home with themselves for a minute and right. get in touch with what's really going on inside instead of believing in the the um, leadership of authorities that don't really have the best interest of everyone at heart well and that's the thing we have to we have to kind of learn to try to trust ourselves um one of the greatest things i think i was taught when growing up is that you listen to everything you take it in but you ask questions question everything and you kind of have to realize that some of the information that's being put out there is is being put out there to just do that to confuse you <laughs> it is to confuse you and to kind of have you figure out what is what from what what's not um but i feel like if we learn to kind of like you said go back to ourselves and go back within and learn to trust ourselves um we can kind of find clarity in the midst of all the chaos if that makes sense Mm -hmm. The one, the one thing that we will always have, despite anything that's going on in the world, is ourselves. We have the ability within ourselves. I feel like to self heal, to you know, to to restore um, broken things within ourselves. But we have to be willing to take the time to go within to do that. And mm -hmm. although this pandemic is happening around us, I feel like people are still afraid of going within and doing that work that's necessary. You know, they may have complaints about not having time to spend with family or working all these hours, but now that they have the time off, how are we spending it? Are we going within? Are we taking the time to find what brings us joy, what makes us happy? Are we reconnecting um, to the parts of ourselves that we feel that we're lost? Are we using the time to find our authentic voices? Because they're not being transparent and we're realizing they've never been transparent but we can be transparent with ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and amongst each other, you know, yeah. with our conversations. Yeah, well, and, and you know, the they that you're talking about that has never been transparent, yeah. um, my feeling is that it actually, that it always has been pretty transparent what the rich elite was about. Right. And for those who were, who have been, um seeing clearly and maintaining mm -hmm. connection with that inner guidance it becomes pretty clear when there is a self-serving agenda yes. involved and yeah, yeah. when there is not a uh, when when it's when systems and um information and authority is based on exploitation of people i mean that energy is pretty darn signature yeah and, and i'm sure as a woman of color as a black woman and the history that you've grown up with you have experienced uh time and again how um you know racism is just endemic in everything mm. and and that's pretty darn clear to you and more and more um, people with complexions like myself are waking up to how clear that is and what a fallacy that is and how that's just a tool of the elite exploiters. Mm -hmm. And so that's always been transparent that that's what's going on, right? Uh -huh. And then as women, there's another level of transparency that we see all the time at, where you know there's this disparity in gender equity and and you know the whole um system of the masculine being dominant over the feminine yeah that's terribly transparent it's painfully excruciatingly transparent right and left it definitely is yeah it's, it's not even it's not even close i mean we we see the most consistency with pay right but then we see the inconsistency with there's still a lot of fields and industries where women have not maintained powers of leadership authority are not listened to you know i grew up in a church and 
for the longest time, a lot of our ministers were all male. <laughs> there were no female ministers. And now we're starting to see more and more and more women who are taking a leadership role and being able to speak in churches and authorities. But there are resolutions that still suppress that, you know? There are different systems that are set up in place to suppress women's sexuality. Uh, I was speaking to a friend and she's from India and she says one of the things is they never really talk about a woman's orgasm or a woman's body and her getting pleasure from the act of intercourse. It's more so about the man or for procreation to have children, but it's never really expressed. And we, I learned recently that like, you know, orga the orgasm is tied to a lot of energy <laughs> and the release of energy, you know, and it is necessary for a woman to experience that in her lifetime as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Just realizing that there's a lot. <laughs> there crazy. is a lot. And, and as soon as we um, start to listen and feel mm -hmm. ourselves, when we become transparent to our own selves, mm -hmm. then all of the ways that our society and humanity is out of balance, disconnected, self-harming, self-sabotaging as, sure. as, a, as, a, as a whole, and um and wounded and and needing of of healing attention uh that becomes clear as we become clear about that for ourselves as individuals okay. and so uh i would love to hear more about your experience so those of you who who aren't who don't know this when you sign up for the womb centered healing temple newsletter you get a free um audio recording of a womb listening meditation and this is what marion was listening to just before we got on the, on the call here today and and so i would like to know i'd like to hear you share more about um some of the things that you talked about uh, uh connecting with through that meditation particularly about your intuition and what that feels like and and you probably have some experience with your intuition from long before you discovered the idea of womb lessening and listened to this meditation so i'm curious what connections you made with um, experiences that you've had in the past of when you've noticed that you did listen to your intuition and how things went and what that felt like and when you notice that you didn't listen to your intuition and how things went and what that felt like <laughs> first the meditation um the meditation for me was really really i felt like i needed that specifically today i felt like uh, all week long kind of all month long i kind of been like i've been here i've been meditating i've been praying but i kind of felt like i was floating because of everything that is going around around us and that meditation really helped to ground me it helped to center me. It helped to refocus and reconnect me to what I need to be reconnected to. Um, for you, those of you who have, haven't listened to the meditation, it's necessary. <laughs> so please <laughs> grab it and listen to it. Um, uh -huh. But doing the meditation, um, there's a part of the meditation where I really felt connected to everything and every everything around me. I didn't feel like just me. I felt just connected, like I was just there. Like I was connected to the to the land, to the sky, to the trees, to everything. I could just feel everything. And it was this overwhelming sense of just not only gratitude, but just connection. Um, realizing that it's not just about me, but it's about everything and everything works together um, in unison. Um, and then the intuition part more so, and you kind of feel this in your gut. It's just like, when you learn to trust yourself and you learn to listen to yourself, I think trust is very important. Because I think the reason why we don't listen to ourselves is because we don't trust our opinions <laughs> about what's going on. We don't trust, we don't trust the voice that, that's talking to us. We don't trust our abilities or believing what we can do. Um, but I feel like when we start listening to our intuition, we gain this sense of trust. And we learn to operate and we learn to move in a way that's aligned with our life and aligned with the pathway and aligned with our purpose. And when we don't listen to our intuition, I feel that there's so many things that go on. I mean, everything that glitters isn't gold. And I feel like when sometimes when you don't listen to intuition, when you get intuition, you may get that big job, but then there's a hundred headaches attached to that one job. And you know, Marion, I can hear that there are some very specific personal stories 
you can tell us about this process of learning to trust the intuition after not trusting. So I'm curious if you have any stories that uh, about how you learned not to trust your intuition, right? Mm -hmm. what, what did you learn to trust instead of your intuition? Can you tell us stories about that? And then can you tell us, and I wanna hear specific stories. Okay. About <laughs> if you, what, what you feel comfortable sharing. I really, like a, I, I really like the storytelling. Well, this happened, this person said this and did this. And I realized, oh my goodness, you know, and this is how we find that voice that's so relatable, right? And mm -hmm. so, so I'd love to hear stories about that. Uh, how you think you learned to not trust your intuition? What did you learn to trust instead? Mm -hmm. And then, where did that trust fall short of what you really needed? Because that's often what happens: is what we learn to trust instead of our own intuition falls short. That's what's happening to all of us collectively right now, right? Mm -hmm. But many of us had that experience a little earlier on, where the things that we were taught to trust didn't feel trustworthy to us one reason or another right yeah well i can just just yeah. growing up as a child you know um and more recently in friendships and relationships i'm very giving i'm a so since i had a people pleaser issue we're in a relationship or friendship i would always give and give and give thinking i was communicating what i needed to in return but realizing that i wasn't communicating clearly mm -hmm. um most recently I had a, a beautiful friendship with a friend who I was in a partnership with in business and the businesses kind of went sideways, but because the friendship suffered because I no longer was communicating with her and trusting my intuition in the situation. Um, I heard my intuition more so was telling me that things were not going right and I had to step away and it was hard for me to trust that and to listen to that gut. So I stayed in the relationship, I stayed in the friendship, I stayed in the business partnership way too long. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it ended, it didn't end the way I wanted to end because my, I didn't, wasn't able to express myself to her the way I needed to and to let her know this is what I was feeling and this is kind of why I have to be, go mute or go silent for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so in that instance, I feel like because I didn't listen to my intuition early on and say something earlier on when I was being hurt or things were being brought back to my attention that weren't a hundred percent. It kind of caused a riff um, in the friendship where there's no longer a friendship at all, uh -huh. you know, and something that I can't revisit. I, I personally wouldn't want to revisit at this point because I wouldn't be listening to my intuition revisiting it. I had to learn to trust that even though there are friends and relationships that you want to be in and there's people who you want to call and pick up the phone sometime and speak to that sometimes it's no. <laughs> It's a right. damaging, it might be damaging or toxic to you or to them, but it's a no. So in that instance, I went against my intuition, but I, I then had to learn to trust it when it was no other choice but to trust it because it was so much damage, you know, mm -hmm. it was too late. Um, so that taught me not to wait too late, too late to, to listen. Right. So the voice you were listening to instead of your intuition, uh -huh. it was telling you all along your your intuition was telling you all along uh that something's not quite right you need to speak up about that 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 didn't feel good what happened there this isn't taking care of you right but but there was another voice that was saying what oh i love you it's okay i love she gets you it. she understands she's just having a difficult time maybe uh, maybe maybe it's not the right time to discuss that it's already a stress in this part of the business is, you know, you have your life. She, it was all these voicing saying, you love this person. So if you love this person, you're not going to cause an argument. And I had back voices of other people in my head saying, hey, you know, you can't say that to her that way. So it wasn't only the voice of love saying, hey, don't speak to her that way. It was other people's voices who have told me that I can't be direct as well. Aha, uh -huh. whose voices are those? Are those from early childhood where when you did when you were direct, you got punished for it or or what were those voices? It was a mix of voices from like like you said early childhood when I was direct, it was more like a punishment type of situation or well, you should just be quiet and you know, sometimes you just got to let people be. Not everyone can be saved type of situation and then even voices later in childhood from you know having conversations when you're in a relationship with friends or even other people's peers or you hear from other people's family members or friends that you can't be direct that also 
you know, directs how you operate and move with people, you know? Like if they say to you, listen, you can't say this to the person. Let me say it, say it to me first, and then I say it. Like those type of um, examples and images are not positive as well either because then it makes you feel like something is wrong with the way you communicate. When in sense, it's nothing wrong with the way you communicate, but that person is not ready necessarily to hear the way you communicate. Mm-hmm. They become accustomed to whatever way they've been given information. Yeah. And, and, and the reasoning behind uh, you can't say that to them, it, it, it sounds to me like perhaps it's protecting them yeah. from getting upset, whereas yeah. you might already be upset and who's protecting you from getting upset? Yeah. Nobody. And that's up to each one of us of, of saying, okay, uh, it's not just, th- this, is a, this is a lopsided relationship. If it's not okay for this person to ever be upset about anything that I'm saying to them. Mm-hmm. And so, but it, but it is okay for me to be upset all the time about things that I can't say to them for yep. fear of them getting upset. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it makes it difficult because then you feel like you have to walk on eggshells about the business side of things and you can't talk about the friend side of things because as a friend you would vent to your friend and tell them what the messed up things the business is doing you know what I mean or just you know express yourself in ways that you would be able to um that over time you can just tell that it's just not <laughs> it's just not gonna work because you can't be one person trying and then when you stop trying everyone realizes that you stop trying you know what I mean like yeah you know this is a really great um example because you're talking about something recent here in your adult life and it sounds like it was a beautiful project to start where it was a collaborative business joint venture kind of a thing with a friend that you felt close to that there was a lot of love between you and this is sort of the ideal thing that many people who are wanting who are trying to create a different kind of reality than Mm -hmm. than the exploitation reality of external authority and all of that we're we're trying to move into a connective co-creative community oriented approach to business and what you're describing is something that i feel uh, is all too common even amongst those people who are wanting to do collaboration and like this and i've had a, a host of experiences with interesting stories to tell of how the disconnected ways that we've internalized come out <laughs> relating to each other and 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 these imbalanced lopsided relationship patterns that any of us may be operating under and this these um silencing gag orders that uh, secret agreements about what it's okay to say and what it's not okay to say and so many of the subtle and not so subtle relationship patterns that we inherited from our parents that we were taught and that we had ingrained upon us by the the systems that are set up to maintain our disconnection from ourselves maintain mm-hmm. that disconnection from our own intuition and keep us silent because yeah 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 and, quiet. yeah, yeah, and that dynamic you just described between you and your friend and business partner is the exact same dynamic we have between different factions in society where it's not okay to speak up because you're afraid they're going to get upset. And the, and the thing is, oftentimes the people we're afraid to upset are the ones who, when they're upset, they become violent and have no qualms about being terribly abusive and harming the people that have upset us, upset them. So, and those are the people that are often the most exploitative and doing the most harm in general. And I'm not saying this is true about your friend, but that it just reminds me of that dynamic of, you know, where the people who are doing the most harm, the bullies, if you will, who are willing to lie, cheat, steal, hurt people to get what they want, are the ones that everyone else ends up kowtowing to, to prevent, you know, to like keep them from going ballistic on everyone and harming people, right? That's scapegoating, right? And I think we experience that in a lot of friendships and relationships, the scapegoat mentality. Who wants to be wrong? 
who wants to be wrong? Like being wrong is one of the, the things that I feel like most people are not going to raise their hand and say it's me. Me, on the other hand, I'm the, I think I'm so blunt and I will call my own BS out mm -hmm. and I will tell you this is who I am. And if you accept it, I'm still working on it. But this is me. I am sensitive. I'm over loyal. <laughs> I am, I will cry and I will shut down and not speak if you hurt me. I will have to go in because I am almost like, I am more of a, I'm very intuitive and I'm, what's the word, empathic, I feel. So a lot of times before things happen, even in relationships and friendships that are going to end, I feel it coming on way before and I get mm -hmm. depressed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will understand that depression or that withdrawal period. It's because I already am warning the relationship that I see that's ending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm already in warning for the end of something because I, A, I know that it's ended and I'm still holding on to it. So it's causing me pain. And B, um, I don't want to let go because I will miss you too much because right. Even when people have, you know, done things I don't like, I still love them. I still have an inherent love for them. And maybe that's wrong on my part to have this, um, this naive love, right? It's, I think in a sense it's naive, but even if you hurt me, I understand that you're operating from the place that you are operating from because you're still healing. And it's not for me to judge where you're at in your healing journey. It's, at, it's for me to say, okay, this is not healthy for me. I can take a step back while you heal and why I work on my healing. And if God allows or the creator allows, we will rejoin at some point in time if that is what it is. And if we never see each other again, I still love you. Mm -hmm. From the bottom of my heart with the love that's pure, I still love, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that actually came out of childhood is the, the ability to love people no matter what they've done or said or did. Um, because... I know that when you hold things like that in your body, it becomes sickness, it becomes stress, it becomes anxiety. And I feel like life is too short with this pandemic that's going on. Life is too short. It's no need to hold on to any type of garage or malice. It was, it was too short before the pandemic started. <laughs> <laughs> that was already true. Exactly. But I'm like, if people are not aware of how short it was before this pandemic, let take something out of this and like don't hold on to anything don't hold on to hurt let go mm -hmm. ask for forgiveness or forgive don't hold on to pain let go there don't hold on to regret if there's something you want to do and you want to get it done do it now there's still days there's still days ahead of us you know you know it. it's it's really beautiful that you say that because um when we look at the um emotional um interpretation of how this virus that that we're all uh, that society has shut down around uh, how that manifests in people's bodies and if we look at the emotional associations with for example lung congestion okay uh, to the point where you can't breathe so the lungs and the throat is where we hold our heart it holds our truth and the lungs in these areas of the chest we hold our grief and and things that we tend to not allow for letting go of um, it, particularly grief it is uh, grief is one of the most suppressed processes in our culture i mean when a when a parent dies for example most you if you have a job somewhere you're lucky to get a couple days off yeah lucky yeah when, or if a child dies or you know uh, or you know a loved one dies you're you're real lucky to get a couple days off and, yeah. for bereavement right? right and so um but and and then there's all the the smaller and bigger griefs that aren't even recognized as something yep, worthy yeah, of attention. Yeah. And so our whole society is founded upon denying the existence of these emotions. Mm -hmm. And where did those emotions go when they're denied? They wow. pack themselves away in our lungs, in our lymph system, in uh, you know, places in our body. And and then so that can only build up for so long before, <laughs> before yeah. it becomes problematic. I mean, this is one of the things you're talking, you're talking about grief right now and everyone is experiencing that on such a, 
it's not the normal grieving process because people can't even bury right now, right? They're not allowed to bury their, their loss. And some people don't even know that people have passed away. They're finding people in nursing home beds and in different spaces that have passed on and no one kind of knows, right? Mm -hmm. So based on the information they're giving us. But so grief and the way we deal with grief and how we handle grief and how we hold space for other people grieving right now has to change too as well. Mm -hmm. um, this, okay, we're going to give you three days off or no time off from work to grieve. It has to be cut out because it doesn't really look at the employee as a human being. <laughs> it doesn't look at their whole holistic health. It doesn't look at their social, their emotional. It doesn't take into, if someone's grieving and they're going through a loss, their focus is not 100% on anything <laughs> at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. I know that sometimes we will push ourselves through and we will say that we got this and we're tough. But I really think that we have to give space for that moment to feel, to cry, to remember, to express. If you, for me, I grew up in, my mom's Jamaican, so the culture is a little bit different in terms of their grieving process. We still grieve, but we have different celebrations. Like in Jamaican cultures, there's a celebration called Nine Night. And there's really nine nights of celebration where they celebrate the life of the person. There's drinks, there's food, there's drinking. People from the town and community come by. And that's kind of what they're doing until this, they, they have like a home going service and a whole ceremonial aspect of to when this person passes away. And I feel like compared to my Jamaican heritage and my American heritage, because my father's from the South, it's a completely different grieving process. The Southern side, when they have a lost experience, they have the funeral, they have the wake, but no one actually talks about too much anymore. They tell stories once in a while. Um, and I kind of seen that whole thing with grief kind of displayed in my father because my father bottles, right? So I had to learn not to bottle grief inside. Mm -hmm. um, because when you bottle grief inside, it displays itself as, as other things, you know? It, it, people will self-medicate to numb that pain and that feeling. People will uh, become excessive workout people <laughs> to numb that pain or excessively shop to numb that pain or eat, right? One of the things that I learned when I became, um, when I was aware that I became, that I was an empath was that sometimes the bodily weight and the heaviness and the heavy setness, it's to block <laughs> the feeling um, from an empath. So I've always been heavy set, very athletic, but always heavy set, but I've always felt, I usually I'm the first person in the room to cry or to feel, I feel death coming. Um, when I was young, I could feel death coming. I would get dreams, right? So I feel like people just have to make the space to grieve. And because we have nothing else to do right now, if, unless you're working from home and we have nowhere else to go right now, to identify what grief feels like for them and to identify what they need at each phase of their grieving process to heal and to overcome. Yes, yes, yes. So what's coming up for me, Marion, right now is for our listeners uh, that perhaps we do a um, impromptu womb meditation focused on listening for guidance around this grief like you just discovered, just like you just described. And um, I just want to say before we do that, if, if you're up for it, <laughs> that I'd be happy in, to, to sort of hold the framework for the meditation. And if there's any inspired words that you want to add to the meditation, you're welcome to do so. Um, and I just want to say that I feel this is, I'm really glad our conversation came to this place because I feel this is super important for our immune systems yeah, to yes. respond and address and become resilient and, and um, not so terribly affected by this specific virus because mm -hmm. it does manifest in overwhelming respiratory uh, buildup of gunk. Yeah, it's really uh -huh. all, the, all the junk inside of us that it's needs to come up. up. Right? It's stuck there. <laughs> so, so this is a way that we can emotionally uh, prepare ourselves and respond to what this virus is asking of us as a collective. And, and this is a classic ho holistic approach to 
um, illness is to say, okay, what is this illness asking me to learn? Mm -hmm. What is this? How is this illness asking me to grow? What, what is it? Um, how is it asking me to heal myself? And it feels like this virus is giving us all a big collective message of you need to let go of your grief. You need to go through that active grieving process because the rest, <laughs> you know, if you think about and rest, right, that's part of it. Part of the grieving process is to rest. And if you think about the word grief, it's the one emotion word that also comes in a verb form. So grieving actual right yeah. we don't we don't do sadding no we don't do angrying no it's we don't do madding we don't do happying we do however do, do grieving. grieving yeah it's a process it's a yeah. process it's not and it's not it's not a linear process it doesn't go in a straight line like this no and it has many different emotions that are part of it yeah. so there's a um book written um by oh her name the woman's name famous woman's name is is slipping my mind right now but it's all about the different stages of grief um uh, that book too. <laughs> yeah you have it too but and you can't think of her name right now but it doesn't matter because i can remember this five, i think it's five stages of grief where there's there's denial yeah right there's bargaining making a deal with the circumstances, with God, however you want to see it. There's um, anger yeah. and there's sadness, I think is part of it. De well, sadness, depression. Okay. Yeah, sadness, depression. And then finally acceptance. Yeah. But there's usually a, a mix. Go back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Back and forth. Like you might find a level of ac acceptance and think, oh, okay, I'm done now. And then it's suddenly a whole other wave yep. of anger or depression or bargaining. Or denial. Or even denial. denial. Exactly. Right. Oh, yeah, I got to acceptance. I'm done with that oh. grieving process. Right. Or there's even, that when you still, you know, even when you think you still see the person or you smell the person, sometimes you're kind of. Okay. Like, they're not in existence no. right something that reminds you of what went on can years later some some yeah. circumstance could, and suddenly here here we are grieving about it again mm -hmm. right well beautiful so let's just do a, a little short meditation here um inviting listeners to feel take a pause for a moment if you were multitasking and listening in while doing something else, uh, we invite you to take a pause and perhaps sit down, perhaps lie down, perhaps just stand still, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling where you're sitting or lying and bringing your hands to your womb. And there's a hand mudra that I like to invite people to, to um, come into, which is this, downward facing triangle with the fingertips touching, pointing downwards and the thumbs touching in the middle. And um, you can place your thumbs at your navel and your fingertips just above or on your pubic bone. And this makes a portal of awareness around your womb space, which it doesn't matter if you have a uterus or not, Everyone has a womb space in, uh, there's a space three inches below the navel and back towards the spine where we all connect with our individual um, flavor of the divine, our individual divine self uh, enters us and embodies in us through this portal. And so we're connecting here with the womb space and this is the this gives us direct uh, direct line of communication to our soul or our spirit or however you want to describe that and just feeling the nourishing giving energy of our hands aimed inwards at this womb space and also the receiving energy of our hands aimed at this womb space and what it might what what this 
place in us, what our soul, what our spirit might be preparing to give us. And just taking a few breaths, taking some deep breaths, feeling the breath, filling the whole pelvis and belly on the inhale and letting out a sigh on the exhale. <sighs> feeling these few sighs and breaths, bringing you more into your center, relaxing you, creating more sensitivity in your hands and what you're feeling in your womb space. <sighs> and I like to feel the connection between the heart and the arms. So we might, many people listening might be more familiar uh, with this feeling our heart when we're getting in touch with our truth. And yes, the heart carries our truth and we can feel that truth and that loving heart energy flowing down our arms and giving that, connecting that with our womb space, with our spirit, with our divine self. And then what do we receive from our divine self? from our womb space as we inhale, what comes back up our center to nourish our heart? <sighs> Taking a few breaths, just feeling that. And particularly when we bring the question of, dear womb, dear source of life, dear direct connection to divine self. What do I need to learn about grieving? What gifts, guidance, wisdom do you have for me about grieving right now and for us? for humanity. And just breathing with that. And Marion, if you have any insights or questions to bring as well. And I just welcome any listeners to take a few moments to feel what insights might come to you. And they might come in the form of visions, perhaps memories, perhaps body sensations, perhaps even thoughts. The womb has a direct line to the brain out of necessity, it's the, way we're, it's the way we're designed. So many meditation approaches discourage us from thinking, but oftentimes with womb listening, the message from the womb comes in the form of thoughts. So often it's that first thought, those first words that come to mind after the question to the womb. And of course, we can feel what those words are. And if they seem unwise or extreme, then we ask for confirmation before taking any drastic actions. <laughs> but my experience is the womb wisdom, the wisdom of our spirit always feels nourishing and right and relaxing there's 
usually plenty of time to make any decisions or changes or take any actions that need to be taken. It usually alleviates the sense of urgency and, pa and panic. It doesn't create a sense of urgency and panic. So just some tips about recognizing and feeling that womb voice and any insights, Mary, and I just want to give you another chance in case I, I see you bubbling over there wondering and I'm curious if you have any insights or anything to share from this meditation. Yeah. Something coming up in my mind, coming a voice uh, that tears are a language and that we need to express and to use that language. Tears are a language, and we need to express and use that language. Tears are a language, and we need to express and use that language. I'm, I'm almost, I'm getting this image of actually uh, collecting tears and putting them down on paper somehow, perhaps adding them to paint or um, making them visible in some way, adding them to colored papers so that it makes the, the colors on the paper create shapes and things like that, allowing them to drop naturally. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing beautiful tear language practices. My goodness, what a gorgeous invitation. So, oh boy, I can't wait to see what comes out of that beautiful got womb guidance for, for us today anything else mary that is it it was very clear and that was the message that i got for us mm. beautiful <sighs> all right well thank you so much for joining me in womb listening today for uh i think we we were together in the energetic plane <laughs> before we even got on the zoom call yes. uh, and um so if folks want to get in touch with you um about anything that that you're up to talking about getting in touch with our true voice right yeah. uh, how how might someone uh get in contact with you to yes. continue the conversation um, they can send me an email, um, marion at marionhenson.com, or follow uh, me on Instagram. I am Marion D. Henson. Um, or just connect with me. I love to speak to people and to connect. So if you send me an email, we could definitely schedule a call and just discuss and collaborate. Awesome. And we have a beautiful collaboration that we uh, – started on this podcast with this idea of tears as a language so if anyone um, is intrigued by this idea and is inspired and starts to get in touch with tears as a language i invite you to come to the womb centered healing temple facebook group and share about it with us there um, it's a it's a growing community um, that I, I'm going to be nurturing more and more in the coming weeks and months and look forward to seeing you there and discussing the language of tears. Okay, well, thanks again, Marion. Thank you, listeners. And until next time, that's all for now.